everyone to our uh, second community update on our budget process. And I'd like to welcome our Calgary and Edmonton campuses that uh, I think this time we got it right. I think our IT is actually working this time. So this is a good thing. So welcome to folks from Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, this is a terrific turnout. So first of all, thank you all for coming out. This is uh, obviously an important issue for all of us at the University of Lethbridge, and so it's very clear that uh, there's great interest in, in the meeting today, and I greatly appreciate the, the turnout today. Today we're going to talk about two things. Uh, first of all, we're going to give you an update on the budget process, and in particular, we're going to give you a very detailed overview of where we're at in the budget process, and in particular, where we're at in terms of our budget reduction strategy. And I will uh, introduce Nancy in a second to, uh, to do that for us. Secondly, once Nancy has um, done the budget update, I will then come back up and give you an update on uh, the letters of expectation or memorandum of understanding, depending on which title you use, and just give you a sense of of uh, the discussions that we've had amongst presidents and with the minister and, and ministry over the last few weeks. Before I introduce Nancy, uh, I just wanted to remind us uh, about the process that we've used to get here today. As many of you know, on March 7th, we had the announcement of a very significant budget uh, reduction for all post-secondary institutions, including ourselves, a 7.3% budget reduction that in the end amounts to about an $11.8 million reduction for ourselves. And Nancy will review those numbers in detail. Following that, and after some uh, good discussion, we decided that we, it was really important as an institution that we use a process that was values-based as we move through the consideration of where best to find budget reductions. And so we went through a, a very detailed process of engagement with many of you on campus. And in the end, uh, the process took us through the Budget Advisory Committee, the Strategic Planning Committee, General Faculties Council, and ultimately our Board of Governors. As soon as the uh, values uh, were approved that were, are meant to help us determine how best to move forward from a budget reduction perspective, uh, we then uh, moved very swiftly to begin to consider um, what areas um, were areas that we should consider from a, a reduction uh, perspective. During that time and during some of the initial discussions, we also sought feedback from uh, many folks uh, through various means, but in particular on the website. And I'd like to thank all those who contributed many great ideas uh, to uh, our consideration relative to the reductions. And, uh, indicate to you that we have used many of your ideas and they, they have very much informed what Nancy will talk about today. But importantly, we will continue to use uh, your ideas as we move forward. And Nancy will talk about uh, some committees that we've struck to continue to move forward in, in seeking uh, ways to find uh, savings uh, within the context of our budget. So thank you again for that input and I can assure you we will continue to seek your input as we continue to move through this very challenging process. In terms of uh, the reduction process, uh, once the values were uh, affirmed, we then uh, moved the reduction process into the Budget Advisory Committee process. The Budget Advisory Committee met on a number of occasions, uh, one very lengthy Saturday morning afternoon meeting where we really kind of uh, got into the detail. Uh, once a, an initial strategy was developed, we then took uh, the uh, concept to the uh, Strategic Planning Committee, and that just took place last Friday afternoon, and thanks to the Strategic Planning Committee for their input. And uh, then further re refinement took place, frankly, over the weekend and up until about uh, half an hour ago. And uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, about a half an hour ago, I think we made our last change. Uh, and uh, so we're here today, I would say, based on lots of input from many of you, uh, lots of great uh, efforts by uh, all those in the faculties and, and in central administration. And so today, this uh, budget reduction um, update 
is uh, based on many different efforts. And I'd like to thank all of those who have contributed because this is a challenging process, but I think in the end, if we continue to move through in a systematic, methodical, and thoughtful manner, manner we will get there in the end. And we are getting closer and closer, and Nancy will, uh, will uh, enlighten you. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Nancy to come up and give us an overview. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for turning out. I know it's been a very anxious time for everyone uh, with the impending budget reductions that we have to implement. Um, so I appreciate your patience as we work through it, as well as, uh, as Mike said, as well as your input. So what we're going to go through today or this morning is just identify um, areas where we think we can cut. Again, I want to emphasize that we're still working through the process. We're still not there in terms of where we're going to be in the final uh, budget presentation and approval by the Board of Governors. But we are getting there, and we have had lots of conversations with many groups, all the employee groups all, and the student groups. So we are, we are methodically going through that. So I will just start the, uh, the presentation. I want, to, I want to set the context of where we are in terms of our budget. What you see on the screen is the operating grant that we receive from the province. So what you can see is we've had uh, positive operating grant increases, except for in 10-11. We had a small decrease, and you can see the 7.3% reduction in our operating grant in the current year that we have to manage. We also, one of the, um, we've been, um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of unhappiness about the letters of expectation, and, uh, but one of the good things that came out of it is that we are now, um, we do know what the numbers are at the other institutions in terms of what they get for their grants. And so we've always mined everyone's financial statements, but it's, sometimes it's hard to, to determine if we're comparing apples and apples, but now we know. So what, we, what you have in front of you is all of the Alberta institutions, post-secondary institutions, and you can see the Campus Alberta grant per um, full load um, equivalent student. And the, the University of Lethbridge is the orange um, bar there. And uh, what we've done is separated between colleges and universities, so the universities are on the, the right-hand side. You can see that the University of Lethbridge does receive an operating grant per student lower than both the University of Calgary and the University of Alberta. And the reason we compare ourselves to those two institutions as well as Athabasca is because they're part of the CARI, which is the comprehensive uh, academic research institutions. So we are, we, pro, we um, basically um, present the same kind of programming with research, which is different than, for example, the Grant McHugh's in the Mount Royal Universities in the province. So you can see that we do get considerably less. The University of Lethbridge received just over $13,000 per student. You, University of Calgary receives uh, 14,600, and the University of Alberta receives 15,900 per student. We also looked at the IMP grant, which is the Infrastructure Maintenance Program. This is a grant that we receive annually to spend on, on uh, repairs and maintenance of our buildings, whether it be um, the utility um, systems or our grounds or just the buildings themselves. So the University of Lethbridge, again, is on the orange, and we receive $258 per student, per full load equivalent student. University of Calgary receives 358, and um, University of Alberta just received just over 500. So you can see, even to start with, we are behind the eight ball in terms of the kind of funding that the University of Lethbridge receives in comparison with our comparable institutions. Our funding sources for the, for the university um, and again, this is uh, what we had, this is the assumption that we had under the operating grant. We have to change this, obviously, once we finalize the budget. But in general, our operating grant is 69% of our revenue, and student fees are approximately 27%. When we look at the expenditures for our institution, again, the largest expenditure is salaries and benefits, which is about 82%. This is on a cash basis. 
we talked about, we spent a lot of time talking about values. And what we wanted to do before we got into our budget cuts is make sure that we talk about um, what's important to us. What do we need to preserve at this institution as we go through this whole process? So we did, as Mike said, we have gone through and it has been approved by the board and General Faculties Council, as well as all the budget advisory committees. So the, the values that we hold most dear to us are people. Our people define our institution and certainly are our greatest strengths. And we will, with these budget reductions, we are certainly striving to preserve employment and to treat all with fairness and with respect, as well as to stay student focused and that we have to make sure that we are financially sustainable. The other value is quality. Again, quality is central to what we do. You basically, you get what you pay for. And when you attend the University of Lethbridge, you get high quality. You, and that's what we're going to try and maintain with the undergraduate as well as our graduate programs. We have high quality instructions and teaching is essential as part of that. We have research and creative activities. We were named the number one undergraduate research institution this year, um, and that wasn't a mistake. It's based on how we allocate our resources at the institution. We are a comprehensive institution, and we have high quality facilities and services. Access is always something that we have always held close to, close to our heart, and it's a fundamental value at our institution. We're dedicated to liberal education, again, high quality academic programs, and community engagement. So what, I apologize for those at the, at the back of the, um, the room, but I will try and just go through the numbers so in case you can't see them that far back. But the budget reductions, as we've said, with a 7.3% grant reduction, we have to come up with $11.8 million this year. We have been told to not budget more than a 0% grant increase in the next two years. So with that scenario, we have predicted forward with our fixed costs that we have, that we will have to, and this is cumulative, by the end of year two, we will be um, having a deficit of $16 million. By the end of year three, it's $20 million. So this is almost 20% of our, of our institutional budget that we have to find. Now we do know, so we're concentrating on the current year, although there are some, some uh, budget reductions that will be going further into the future. But we do know that we have some budget adjustments that we have done, and I'm going to go through each one of them. The first one is our academic staff voluntary retirement program. And, um, and you can see that it actually increases in future years. We don't have a lot of savings in the current year because a lot of people are, it is a phased approach over several years. So we won't realize those savings until, um, until the second or third year. And salary services, we're um, ex asking for additional contribution to operating. We also budget cost of living increases for employment but most of that's based on our uh, consumer price index. So we have to budget for that a year in advance. So what we had budgeted, we had budgeted slightly higher than what the consumer price index came in at at 1.05. So there is some savings this year for that. We are also looking, uh, the board also approved in the fall an increase to our student administrative fee, and that gets us um, 172,000, as well as even though when we were expecting the 2% grant increase, we were, um, we were still having to make cost cuts because of the fixed costs that we have. So we already had achieved $2.6 million in cuts that we had determined uh, for the budget before it came out at, seven point, at minus 7.3. So we have found um, $4.7 million right now of the 11 million point eight that we have to cut. In, um, again, um, this is just moving it forward on items that are still under discussion. They haven't been approved by, by the board or, by, or presented, to, presented to GFC, but we are looking at reducing life cycle equipment, uh, research enhancement fund, and um, the international student differential fee, as well as student administrative fee. I do have a line there for, for salaries and benefits, but we can't talk about that. We have, um, we have contracts that we're negotiating right now. It is confidential. We don't want to bargain in bad faith, and we have to, um, and we will honor our contracts that we have right now. So there's still a lot of, um, 
discussions going on in particular about those particular items. When we look at um, our values, what I've done here is where we've tried to, one of our values is to treat everyone in fairness and with respect. So when we look at how we're going to make the budget reductions, we try and, and make sure that um, no one group or no particular um, program is, is, is being affected more than an, another. Now obviously there's gonna be some great, some you know, deviations on that, but we're trying to stick as close as we can to that value. So when we look at the budget product um, estimates that we're trying to do for reductions, at the end of the three years, if all comes to fruition, where we, where we are today, that employees will um, be attributable to 57.4% of it, ancillary services 2.5, students at 10.9, Life cycle equipment fund at 5%, research at 1.5%, administrative operations at 13.1%. We still haven't got identified cuts of about 9.7%. Again, this is the best case scenario that we're working on right now because there will be fluctuations in some of the numbers that we have up there right now because of the discussions we're having with the various groups. So the first one I want to talk about is the Academic Staff Voluntary Retirement Program. When, the, when we put out this program, we were still, we put it at, we were discussing it late fall and we, and we issued it in January. And uh, we were still under the impression that we were going to get a 2% grant increase. We knew that we were going to have difficulty with our budget cuts in the future. And so we, we had put out the program. When we put out the program, we had hoped to replace all of the positions that were under the voluntary retirement program. And we were going to renew the faculties and look at where we can allocate the positions um, to strategic priorities within the institution. Unfortunately, with the 7.3% budget reduction, it is unlikely that we'll be able to replace the majority of the positions. There will, of course, be some positions that we have to replace because of strategic priorities, as well as we have to make sure that we offer the programs that we are continuing to offer. But so we will be going through that on, um, over the next few years. There were 34 academic staff who, who we've approved through the, through the program. The cost of the incentive payments is just over $4 million. And we're taking that from one-time funds, unrestricted reserves. And uh, we also received a grant from the, from the province of $1.7 million. They gave that as a, that as a transition uh, fund, it wasn't, wasn't based on anything, it was basically a pro rata, but they knew because the budget came out on March 7th and our year end is April 1st that we had to have some transition money to get us over before we could establish the, the, our final budget. So we do, we do estimate by the end of the three years that we hope to save a, approximately $4 million. That is with that number, um, we have calculated some replacement of positions, but again, we have to work through that. When we look at the values, what we're trying to do is we need to t tie in the values that we have into the reductions that we're, that we're proposing. So we have to see what the impact is. You have to realize that all the values will be impacted somewhat because it's, it's not, it's not a, you know, a black and white um, situation. So when we look at the people, the academic voluntary staff uh, retirement program it will minimize the impact on forced position abolishments. It will allow renewal of faculties. Um, unfortunately, it will have fewer academic staff in the faculties, but we hope to uh, retain or replace those positions in order to retain the current academic programs. In terms of quality, the academic programs will be maintained. Um, unless, of course, there, there are programs that the, the students that dictate that the program is, needs to be suspended. It may impact quality due to the workload spread out over fewer academic staff. When we look at access, we feel that there's probably um, minimal impact on the student access. So um, anyway, that's, so that's how we determined that that was, um, the, the impact on our values was the least amount with this particular program. Ancillary services. Ancillary services is our bookstore, printing, conference services, food, and housing. Now, we don't contribute anything from our operating fund to ancillary services. 
So, and in fact, they contribute to the university operating funds. They pay for all the expenses, whether it be through security, uh, financial services, HR, um, and facilities that all the services that they receive from the university, they do pay for. In addition to that, they also contribute $150,000 to the university operating budget. We are going to increase that contribution for ancillary services to $500,000. What this means is normally that money is being put into capital reserves because we don't fund any of the capital equipment for ancillary services. They have to build it up just like any other business if they were separate from the institution. So the impact on our values, it will have minimal impact on employees. We don't think it'll have any impact on the access. And the high quality, it will certainly contribute, the, the 500,000 will contribute to student services and enhancing student engagement. We're not sure of the impact on the quality for the capital, because again, there'll be fewer dollars going into ancillary services, capital reserves. They may not replace their equipment as frequently as they are, or do the repairs that they're doing as frequently as they are. But all in all, we felt that this was minimal impact on our values. Life cycle equipment allocation. Currently, we allocate just, or just over $2.4 million on an annual basis to life cycle. And it gets allocated basically to the faculties in some large administrative units. And um, it is for replacement of research equipment, teaching equipment, whatever it is that the, the faculty determines. Now, there is, um, so we are suggesting that we reduce that to $1.4 million and we could save a million dollars annually with the allocation on that. When we look at the values and tie that into that, there will be minimal impact on employees. The access, there could potentially be a negative impact on the access because we'll have a more outdated equipment. Um, so it may be more difficult to attract and retain students and faculty. We're not sure about that. Again, the quality, there may be a negative impact on that as the equipment for teaching and research will grow outdated over time and we won't be able to replace them as quickly as we can. Again, though, when we look at our values, this was something that we felt that we could do. We research enhancement awards. Currently, we contribute $300,000 um, to assist with research within the faculties. And um, you can see that over the, over the last six years, we have contributed. It's approximately the same for every faculty um, over the years because we base it on the number of faculty that are, the number of faculty members that are in each faculty. So it doesn't change that much over the year. We just prorate it. And each of the deans does use it for um, various um, things, whether they give teaching load, whether they give travel for research. Um, it, it's up to the dean and um, the dean's advisory on how they allocate that within the faculty. In terms of people values, we feel it's a minimal impact on our employees, could have a potentially um, negative impact on the faculty progression through the ranks if we have less dollars going in for research. Access, we don't feel that there's um, a significant impact on the student access. For quality, it will have a potential for negative impact on the research productivity because of fewer dollars going there. Also, it could impact the undergraduate research engagement depending on how the faculty spent the money. Student administrative fee. A student administrative fee is um, a fee that we charge on a per course basis to students for student services. Uh, we implemented this fee in 2002, 2003 at $10.50 a course. We kept that fee the same until 2011-12, and we increased it by $2.50 to 1250 and the board um, approved an increase in the last fall to $15 per course. The impact on students is that we are increasing it to, uh, we're suggesting that we increase it to $3,750 per course. This will increase student revenue, or I mean the revenue to the institution of about $1.7 million. The effect on a student at three, if they take eight courses over the years, will be an increase of $200 a year per student. Now we are still um, discussing with our students. We had a meeting yesterday on this fee, so nothing's been finalized for sure with this. And I do understand the, the concerns that the students have, but this is what the proposal that we looked at before, and again, we have to finalize it. Trying to put it into perspective, with eight courses per year, 
um, the students are paying approximately, um, actually I should back up a bit. Um, there was a change last week that we received notice from the, the province that um, the tuition increases are frozen for the current year. So we had approved tuition fee increases in the fall of last year for the current year. Um, to increase from 492.50, of course, to 503, which is the 2.15% um, that the province had told us we could increase tuition fees by last year. Where that has now been taken off, and so students are paying the same tuition as they were in 2012. The government has said that they are going to make the institutions whole and give us a grant for the tuition that we are losing, the institution is losing on that. We still haven't seen any documentation on that and, and we're a bit worried about that as well as we're not sure that it's continuing funding. It may be just funding for the current year coming up. Uh, and we're looking at the, anyway, if you look at the difference what we approved in the fall, um, there was going to be an increase of 3.14% with tuition increases as well as a couple other um, tuition fees or other fees that were students were paying. What we are proposing with the increase in the administrative fee is an increase of 4.92% uh, for students um, over the 2012 tuition fees rate, which is actually a 1.72% per student over the, the rate that was approved in the fall. When we look on our values on the student admin fee, it will have minimal impact on employees. It does increase the cost per students. In terms of quality, we feel that we need to do this in order to maintain the quality of our institution. And it also maintains the student engagement services like the quality initiative programs that we have with the students. Uh, with this increase, the U of L still has the lowest fees in the tuition ac um, across Alberta for the, the CARI, the Comprehensive Academic Research Institutions for um, whether that's Athabasca, U of C, or U of University of Alberta. Certainly with access, it has potential to be a negative impact on our student access because the cost of education will increase. We have no idea about the known impact on the future student enrollment. We certainly look at studies done at elsewhere. We've looked at um, where in Britain, for example, a few years ago, they increased substantially their tuition. Their enrollment did not go down. There was an increase in Ontario and Quebec and their enrollments haven't gone down. We've looked at the studies. When students look at, at program, where institutions to go to, they look mainly at the program that they're going to be studying and they look at the, the reputation of the institution. The, the amount of the fee impact is that students will look at approximately, you know, based on the reviews that we've looked at, 10%, it does influence 10% of their decision on what institution to go to. The next fee that we're looking at is uh, the visa student differential fee. We do have a multiple um, on the undergraduate fee that the, that the international students pay. The University of Lethbridge, you can see it on the yellow, on the far left bar there. It's um, 2.26 is the multiplier that we use for our undergraduate program. As you can see, we are um, the third lowest of all the international differentials across the, um, across the West, if you will, on institutions. Calgary has a differential of 3.4 and um, Alberta has a 3.48. We're recommending that we go to a multiple of three, and uh, this will allow what we're estimating approximately almost $900,000 a year in additional fees from, from international students. When we met with the students yesterday, um, there was great concern about that, and we certainly recognize the concern that they have. We do have students that are enrolled in our international program right now. To change the fee on them as they're halfway through the program is, is is a burden for them. So we do plan, uh, we accept that we will grandfather this, this fee in. So basically the current students that are enrolled right now into the program will continue on the current multiple of the 2.26 and we will, uh, for any new students coming in, we will start to charge the multiple of the three. When we look at the values, again, we feel that this has a minimal impact on employees. High quality, it will certainly maintain the services for the international students that we have. It is, again, as I stated, the lowest international student fee. It does have, of course, have the potential of negative impact on international students because of the cost of education 
does um, increase for them, and we're not sure of the impact, again, on uh, student enrollment. There there's been a lot of discussion recently, obviously, about items that we're discussing in, in terms of budget reductions. So we have talk, talked a lot about uh, various programs that we have. So we, there are some reductions that we considered, but we rejected based on the values that we have. The Students uh, Quality Initiative Program, we currently contribute $470,000 a year. What they use those funding for is for research, for scholarships, for student engagement services. And uh, we consider them very valuable and uh, we do want to continue with that. So we have taken that one off the table. Scholarships, we do fund almost $1.6 million in scholarships out of our operating fund right now. And um, again, scholarships are very important. If fees are going to go up, then we need to maintain those scholarships. What we are looking at that particular line is that we can't solve that problem today, but what we hope to do is be able to fund scholarships rather than out of operating, but out of external funds, whether it be through donors or um, other opportunities that we can have. So we will be pursuing that to take it out of the operating fund and move it to external source. First year faculty awards, we do contribute $100,000 for that that we allocate it to the faculties based on the, the first year that the faculty come in. We feel that this is very important. It helps the, the new faculty establish their career, help them along with our research program. So we feel that that's important and we need to continue with that. Same goes with the community of research excellence development opportunities. There's a lot of benefit that we receive for that. And um, so we're going to um, suggest that we continue with that as well. We also contribute $250,000 a year for matching funds for Canada Foundation for Innovation. This is, uh, we can leverage these funds to receive more money from either the province or the federal government. Again, we need research um, to continue. It is a very important value at our institution and we need the equipment and the facilities in order to do that. Research Enhancement Awards, there is a small fund of just over $100,000. Again, because research is important, we do plan on continuing with that. A lot of the suggestions that we've had through the website and, and um, is discussion about our, our northern campuses. And we do have low enrollment on our Edmonton campuses. We are going through a transition phase with that. We are a new space in both our Calgary campus as well as our, Ed, as well as our Edmonton campus. We feel that that is a great benefit to us. We have saved considerable amount of operating dollars because of the move to those campuses. It's probably almost $500,000 in lease payments um, because of the moves that we've done there. The Edmonton campus, if you exclude the faculty salaries on that, if we shut it down, it would be approximately $360,000. We need to do more work on this particular one. We feel that it is very important for us to be there. There's uh, great programs that we offer there. And so we have already committed to the board last year that we would continue to look at that program and, um, and see how we can enhance it or we'll make a decision in future years. We also looked at some reductions in the sport and recreation services area, but we feel again, student engagement is very important to us. So we took that off the table as well. Again, we're, we haven't balanced our budget yet. We still have a ways to go. And uh, for those of you that, um, I've said this before, for those of you who have ever been on a diet, the last five pounds is always the hardest. And so we still feel that we still have um, some hard, some hard uh, decisions that we have to make. But we have budget subcommittees that we're going to put into play, or already in place. And these are in eight areas. We feel that we can probably achieve some efficiencies in operations, either through collaboration or um, combining uh, resources. We're looking at the administration. We're looking at areas like communications and marketing, our information technology, recruitment, finance, faculty work assignments and faculty program costs, collaboration with other institutions, revenue generation, as well as, of course, we're into employee negotiations and discussions with those groups. And those, we expect to have the reports done by the end of July, and then we will make some more budget decisions on that. Some other budget reduction suggestions that have come up through the website or um, through senior administration is we're looking at perhaps we can reduce the number of computer labs we have. That can save a few dollars on the servicing of computer labs. The utilization of our labs right now is is not good. 
So if we reduce labs and we move it to more to fewer labs, we'll have higher utilization within that as well, so we can save a few dollars there. I've already talked about student awards that we're looking for funding from external sources rather than internal. We um, there's always the possibility of an employee voluntary reduced load um, if we have employees who perhaps have young families and they want to take an extra week off unpaid work um, during the summer, for example, that we would consider these um, options. Again, it would be on a unit by unit basis and supervisor. We'll look at the library acquisition budget and program or academic programs. Again, we are going to be reviewing all budget suggestions from the university community and we're still working on it. I want to emphasize again our values. We have to strive to maintain our values, and that is people, quality, and access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. As I said, uh, after Nancy's presentation, I, I would give you a, a brief update on the letters of expectation, and then we'll certainly open it up for, for questions. Um, in terms of the letter of expectation, I did send out a, uh, or post an update after the meeting uh, that was held in Edmonton. Um, I'm lo losing track of time, I think almost two weeks ago, Thursday. Uh, the, uh, the meeting that, that we held was with uh, the minister, as well as the deputy minister, assistant deputy minister, and a number of individuals in the ministry. Prior to the meeting on the Thursday afternoon, all 26 presidents uh, met at Grant McEwen Un University for the morning uh, to ensure that we had a common uh, perspective uh, prior to going into the meeting with the, with the minister. That ended up being a very helpful uh, meeting because uh, it ended up that we, uh, we created a, our sense of how best to move forward and, and actually met with the deputy minister at lunch prior to the meeting with the minister in the afternoon. Uh, in doing so, we were able to communi communicate to the deputy minister that uh, it was really important, critically important, that when we met in the afternoon, uh, we were able to come out of that meeting with a way forward that was um, much more based on, on a collaborative foundation whereby the letters of expectation uh, were the result of um, a very thorough discussion, certainly with the ministry, but importantly with our, within our university and college communities. And so as a result of a, an interesting back and forth discussion with, with the minister and deputy minister uh, throughout the afternoon, uh, the end point of the discussion was that uh, we agreed uh, with, with the minister that first off, the letters of ex expectation would not um, be completed until the fall. Uh, right now, the, the, uh, the fall is identified as September 1st, but we're actually trying to push on that uh, to move it back into October uh, in order that we have uh, the uh, appropriate amount of time to consult with, with you and with uh, ourselves uh, as presidents and with, within the context of our sectors. And so that was a very um, important uh, first step. The second step was to... Um, to agree that the letters would be reconceptualized as uh, having three components. Component one is uh, a system component, um, which is really uh, looking at issues related to uh, collaboration uh, pathways uh, for students and these sorts of things. The second component is a sector component, so in our case, the Cary sector, and in particular looking at how we as uh, the Cary institutions um, think about the future in terms of what is most important and appropriate for our institutions to, uh, to engage in, to, in order to contribute to the development of a very strong uh, research and teaching uh, context within our sector. And the third component is the university component, and this was, and college I should say, because obviously the letters rate, relate to universities and colleges. And so the, the third component is critically important because it, it is very much about how we see our institution fitting within the context of Campus Alberta, our vision for our university, how we see ourselves uh, differentiating um, this university from others both within the province and outside of, of the province and the country. And so in the end, we were in agreement that uh, moving forward with those three elements to these letters, 
um, we would be much more comfortable engaging in a discussion with the minister and ministry. Following the meeting on the Thursday, we had a follow-up meeting on the Monday, uh, just again with uh, presidents of the 26 institutions. We met in Red Deer, and we began the discussion related to uh, how we would engage in a, as a system, how we do engage as a system, and in particular, one of the things that we talked a lot about is um, doing a better job communicating to the ministry as well as to the, the public at large as to the levels of engagement we already have amongst ourselves, as to the extent to which we already have amazing student pathways on many fronts, and, and in particular, as we know, our University of Lethbridge is a, an exemplar in, in, this, uh, in this arena. And so I would say that the letters of expectation will unfold with the presidents very much um, committed to working uh, collaboratively amongst the 26th of us, uh, and in particular, beyond that, uh, engaging with our own communities to ensure that when these letters are signed off, that we are comfortable, that they are reflective of what our priorities are as institutions. Now, I do know that um, in the forum that we held last time, there was a lot of discussion and concern about the notion of duplication. And so we had a very lengthy discussion with the minister about duplication. And uh, I think we, in the end, agreed, and he agreed, that, um, that duplication was being described in a fairly inappropriate manner, in that there was this sense that if um, more than one university or a number of universities and colleges have similar kinds of programs, that that's a bad thing. And I would say by the end, uh, we had agreement that, in fact, if we're interested in creating student access, that duplication is a necessity, uh, not something that we should look down upon. The other thing that we agreed is that the notion of differentiation is very important, and that in order for institutions to truly meet the needs of a cross-section of learners across Alberta and beyond, uh, differentiation uh, is an enabler. And so we know that differentiation is very important for our university. We see ourselves as very different than the other Cary institutions. We have created a, a, an environment here that students uh, choose to, to come to because they choose to have the University of Lethbridge experience versus the University of Calgary experience or the University of Alberta experience. And so I'm confident that we will be able to continue to communicate about the importance of our institution from a differentiation perspective. So that's um, the, uh, the highlights in terms of the, uh, the letters of expectation or memorandum of understanding as we're starting to call them. Uh, and certainly uh, when we open it up to questions, if you have any other specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, before I, I sort of finish off, I just wanted to um, emphasize uh, one of the things that Nancy said on a few occasions during her presentation is that, and that is that this is a process and we will continue to move through this process. We are not done the budget reduction process. We are in the midst of it. I think we've made great progress. I think you can see by the numbers that we've put up on the, uh, on the, the screen that uh, we are a lot closer to the $11.8 million reduction today than we were uh, when this was announced, but we have a lot of work to do and, as we move forward, and so we will continue to look to all of you for both your support as we uh, figure out how to move through this, but also importantly for your ideas as we uh, continue to think about what are the best ways for us to manage through what is certainly a challenging time. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions on either the budget reductions or on the letters of expectation. We are going to insist that you actually come to the mic uh, because if you don't come to the mic, uh, we're not able to um, have our folks in Calgary and Edmonton hear your question. So um, if you put your hand up, you can move to the mic, please. Can you move to the mic? Rumor has it that in uh, university funds, there is significant carryover from past budgets. So my question is two parts. Uh, what is the size of that carryover? And the second part is, to what extent is that money being spent to counteract the effects of the current budget cut? 
So uh, the, the quick answer is yes, we do have reserves. All universities have reserves and importantly, uh, these reserves uh, enable us to ensure that we can manage through rainy days. We are, um, I wouldn't describe ourselves in a rainy day. This is uh, more like a thunderstorm. Um, but uh, these, uh, these funds are very important. I'm gonna get Nancy to talk about the actual specifics of where we're at from a, uh, a carry forward perspective. Yes, that's been talked about a lot in terms of our financial um, funding. So we do have uh, reserves. We have carryover accounts that um, basically, the, just to explain a little bit how that works, is we have an annual budget that we allocate to budget units and the faculties. And if they are able to save money within that budget unit in that current year, they are allowed to carry those funds over to the following year. Uh, there is a maximum in terms of the amount of funds that they can carry over, so they can only keep within each unit a maximum of 5% of their annual allocation. So we try and what, and the, the, the excess, if there is any excess, goes to central so that we can fund strategic priorities. Now, I just, I don't have the exact numbers for the, the year end, the fiscal year end. It's just hot off the press. Carrie Takiyasu and her group in financial services have been working hard over the last month finishing up our financial statements, so we haven't actually got them completely done yet. But we, what we're looking at is we have approximately um, $10 million in carryover, and uh, there is one-time funds of $8 million. That is for very specific designated, whether that be capital projects, money that we have received externally from the province to fund capital projects or to fund um, specific uh, programs. For example, we received just $8 million last month, or sorry, $3 million last month for health um, programming from the province. That's supposed to be spent over three years. So that $3 million is included in that. We also have $6 million in strategic priority funds. We're using that for IT projects, for the student portal projects that we're implementing right now. Those are significant um, uh, projects that we have to implement, and we have research funds there. We also have $3.3 million in life cycle funds. So all in all, in terms of what we have that we can to work with, we have approximately $9 million that we can work with that isn't designated right now. We do need a significant part of that, those funds, uh, we're estimating about six million dollars that we have to, that will transition us in the budget reductions that we're doing right now. Our budget started on April 1st, so with 12 million dollars that we have to cut um, over the year, every month that goes by we are spending a million dollars. And of course some of the, some of the items that we have going forward uh, will not be come to fruition, we will not be realizing because of, for example, the voluntary retirement program until years two and three. So we need these funds in order to, to, to um, get us through the deficit. We don't want to be making cuts in year one and, um, and then have to reinstate the program or, or have, have employee layoffs and then eventually have to reinstate them because, the, because of the way the budget reductions are working out. So all in all, we do have reserves, but we do have most of it designated for use, either through the budget rejections or special strategic projects. Thanks, Nancy. Yes. Nancy, you put a whole list on the board showing the percentages from each area that um, the basically the cuts are coming from. Um, as you said, you were trying to be sure that no one area took the biggest hit. I noticed that faculty was taking 57.3%, and the next biggest was administration at 13.1%. I've heard from my own dean's advisory that they're considering increasing our teaching load by as much as 50%. Um, this doesn't seem to me quite even. If you look at the, if you look at the, the, um Find it if I can. What I have there is not faculty, it's employee groups. Okay. So everyone's included in that 57%. And um, if, if you look at, and that includes everything related to, it's not just the position funds, it's whether it be employee benefits or what do we contribute for that relate to employees. So if you look at our budget with 82% of our budget in salary and benefits, it's a reasonable percentage to consider. 
Hi, good morning. My name is Philippe, and I'm the international rep for the Students Union. And my question is regarding the potential increase on uh, international student tuition. And Nancy mentioned that research has been done regarding student enrollment with an increase in tuition in Great Britain. And I was just wondering if uh, there's any research has been done regarding uh, potential increases in international tuition in other uh, post-secondary institutions in Canada and also outside Canada. And also as an international student here at the University of Lethbridge, I can say that the reason why I chose this university is because of its high quality education programs and its cost effectiveness. And my question is, how does this increase in tuition affect those reasons that myself and um, other international students choose this university? So related to your, uh, thanks for, for those questions. Related to your first question relate, uh, regarding evidence, uh, there is quite a bit of evidence both in Canada as well as uh, um, more broadly that uh, the uh, international differential uh, does not necessarily have a large impact on, uh, on enrollment. And so if you look at British Columbia as an example where uh, I think we had the, uh, the, the UBC um, one is four point something if I remember. Uh, their international um, enrollment has increased dramatically. I actually uh, uh, was just in meetings the other day uh, with the, the uh, new uh, president of SAIT who came from British Columbia and he um, described their process of international, uh, increasing their differential and the extent to which it actually drove enrollment up, not down. And so while certainly the University of Lethbridge is really concerned about access as we've noted and in, uh, concerned about ensuring that we treat our international students fairly. We also have to balance that with, with, um, with the challenge that we have at hand. And so what we've tried to do is come up with a, um, a, moderate, a moderate increase that still has us as the lowest uh, cost for international students in the carry sector and certainly one of the lowest in, in Western Canada. And I think a very important change uh, that occurred as a result of uh, our discussions with the students was that we would not impact students that are already on the University of Lethbridge campus because that is a, a significant concern of ours. So we'll grandfather those students in and this uh, will uh, only impact those students that are um, coming to campus and, and in particular uh, so that from a transparency perspective students know what they're getting into so that any student applying to the University of Lethbridge will actually know what the differential uh, fee uh, is so we won't be, there won't be any surprises for our students. So absolutely we're concerned about access, absolutely we want to ensure that we continue to recruit international students and so trying to find that balance is I think what that uh, 3.0 differential uh, is all about. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the, the specifics. I think uh, most people in the room appreciate to have the chance to, to respond to those and to ask questions about those. My question at the moment, though, is a, uh, about sort of the broader question that you started to hint at with respect to the letters of, um, of uh, well, the memorandums of understanding or whatever they're going to be called. Whatever they're going to be called. About the relationship between the minister and the government and, and us as an institution. Uh, so questions of uh, what I would call in air quotes ministerial oversight. Uh, so we've heard suggestions that the Post-Secondary Learning Act is going to be revisited uh, in a, perhaps a serious way. Uh, the minister has indicated that he uh, may or may not approve, for example, some of the cuts proposed at Mount Royal University. So my question, I suppose, is what specific strategies or processes are we considering, our, our administration or others, considering uh, for both anticipating and potentially resisting the kinds of government, what I'll call interference, that we're seeing uh, letters to board chairs, for example, that I would suggest are inappropriate given uh, bargaining processes and whatnot. It's certainly a new landscape for us, one that has changed uh, dramatically. And uh, so we are, um, I think, working to respond um, carefully, thoughtfully, but also with, uh, with an eye to, in the end, the uh, fundamental autonomy of the institution. And so as we think about letters of expectation or the opening of, um, of the Post-Secondary Learning Act or, or what the minister might or not say about uh, the uh, six-sector model, we are in constant discussions on, on one level uh, with, within the context of our executive team, with our deans, with, uh, with uh, many folks on campus about uh, those concerns and about strategies for 
addressing uh, the concern around autonomy. But I would say on another level, what's really important is that the, uh, all of the institutions in Alberta um, develop a, a common perspective on this. I'm um, in the midst of uh, the annual meeting of uh, the uh, presidents of universities across Canada. Uh, we're meeting in Calgary, so I just drove back this morning. And at dinner last night, I was uh, speaking with uh, a colleague who is a president of one of the BC universities. And we had a long discussion about what they've gone through in British Columbia re related to their letters of expectation. And he indicated to me that in the end, what was most effective was when all of the institutions actually finally came together collectively to develop a collective response. And that it was once the collective response was developed and communicated to the minister that there was uh, a softening of the perspective of the ministry relative to challenges around institutional autonomy. So my belief, my strong belief is that our way forward needs to be a collaborative way forward with our other institutions, that we need to develop a common perspective as to our areas of concern, and that we need to communicate that effectively. And that was really, uh, that, that process was started on that Thursday with the minister. And I think I was, uh, I was very pleased with our ability as 26 presidents to uh, sit around the same table, um, have some dark humor for the first uh, uh, half an hour or so, and then move into a thoughtful discussion about where we see ourselves uh, sitting from the perspective of institutional autonomy, from the perspective of what is uh, in the best interests of students, what is in the best interests of research uh, within the context of uh, universities and colleges and the like. So it is a, it's a, it's a grave concern to all of us, uh, but I think we, uh, we are on it on one level, I would say, and very, very mindful of the concerns that this community has. And I would say your concerns are mirrored across the province. And I'm sure you've uh, seen that in uh, all of the different uh, news uh, items that have come out. And I'm sure in talking with uh, your colleagues at other universities, um, you've had similar conversations. Armin. Uh, thank you. Um, many of the options that you've presented today are being phased in over a few years. Uh, however, the student administrative fee is going to be implemented at a 300% increase uh, all in one go, uh, which, is, which is quite significant uh, when, when it comes to the cost, uh, because not only does it offset the tuition freeze, it's actually more uh, than we would have been paying for otherwise. Uh, so I'd like to ask you again to, to reconsider at minimum of, of implementing this fee um, over, over a few years, so phasing that in. Um, overall, though, I would just like to point out, though, that, that we do not like this fee uh, because it is not clear exactly what it goes towards. Unlike the sports and rec fee, this student administrative fee or student services fee covers a variety of things, uh, which seems to be a moving target every year uh, that, that you have been using to sort of justify the fee. You're selecting various student services on campus to make it equal the number that you're going to be um, collecting from this fee, and, and that's why we are against this fee, because of how unclear it is, and it's not uh, just because of the unclarity of, of that fee. Thank you. Thanks, Armin, and I, I know uh, you had a, a very good discussion yesterday uh, with uh, the senior team, and I'm sorry I wasn't there. I was, uh, as I said, at, at meetings. Uh, and I, do, I, I know that you've uh, expressed concern about this uh, fee, and we, that we've had this discussion on an ongoing basis. Uh, it is a, a challenge for us as an institution to think about how best to fund uh, what are what we think some of the most important elements of what we provide here for students, and that is the various student services on campus. And so we have resisted, as Nancy uh, evidence showed, uh, we have resisted increasing fees for years um, because we have been dedicated to ensuring student access. And, and I think that, that one slide showed dramatically how we maintained the level at, uh, I think, $10.50, uh, and then uh, slowly started to increase it. And we did so at a time when other institutions in the province were increasing their student fees dramatically. We are now part of a new landscape. And this new landscape is uh, the most challenging landscape institution in this province have faced for many, many years. And so our challenge is to balance, as we've talked about, uh, our, our values around access with our values around quality and our values around people. And so when we look at uh, the, the cost that students are, are bearing, 
uh, today and uh, you know, potentially in the future in terms of these increases, we still see that we are uh, the university uh, in the carry sector that has the lowest uh, tuition and the lowest fees, and, and this is important for us. And so we have, not, we have been very mindful about the level to which we've increased these fees because we have been dedicated to continuing to try to ensure access. But uh, we are having to try to ensure access with one hand tied behind our back, frankly. And this is a challenge for our institution. And so it, it is very much a balancing act. Now, I know as, as uh, was discussed yesterday, we are still um, considering how best to move forward. So there are discussions that, that are continuing to have. This does have to go to General Faculty's Council ultimately and, and then on to the board. But I have to say that when I, when I look at the, that one where Nancy showed the balance of um, uh, how we're managing this budget reduction and, and we see that uh, you know, the, uh, the contribution from all um, staff is in the 57% range and then, and then uh, down from there. I think that uh, we have found uh, the balance that uh, is necessary. Warning. Spill ramp, sociology. Yeah. Um, just, um, I want to go back for a minute to the memoranda of understanding and the negotiations around those. Uh, my understanding from news reports is that um, a follow-out from the uh, April 11th meeting was that there were going to be three what were called tables established uh, for discussions, one for uh, the boards, one for administrators, and one for students. Uh, no table for any employee groups, and in particular, no table for faculty. Uh, given that the MOUs uh, will be dealing with issues that have to do with uh, curriculum matters, for example, among other things, um, I'm just wondering if there's any discussion among the presidents about that particular absence and how the presidents might respond to that. Um, yes, we have had discussion about that, and I would say um, the way that we've discussed this is that the, uh, the table for faculty and staff is our table. And one of the things that I think is really important is not to give up everything on our table to a broader table. And so when we think about how we uh, see ourselves creating um, our sense of uh, the future for the University of Lethbridge as it relates to our academic programs, uh, our student support services and the like, uh, we have done an outstanding job as a university considering that at our table. And so going forward, uh, I personally, um, I'm quite resistant of having too many tables that are, are beyond our table because it, it really uh, begs the question as to how universities uh, um, are challenged to create their own sense of uh, who they are and, and who they think they should be in the future. And so, um, as I, I described related to the uh, MOU, um, that third um, component, which is about us, which is, is about each institution, is where the discussion uh, will take place amongst faculty, staff, and students about uh, who we are as a university, uh, what our mandate is, and how we see ourselves moving forward. And, and I think that's, that's the fitting place for it, personally. Chris. Thanks, Mike. Um, on, uh, on Friday, I guess, the uh, the government announced that tuition fees are frozen for 13-14, so that the 2.15% increase which was scheduled to be made isn't going to be made. And uh, it was also indicated in that uh, press announcement that the, uh, the reduction is, uh, is going to be provided to the institution by virtue of the department providing some funding, I think $16.5 million was the figure, from department reserves. Um, so clearly, this is one-time money. Clearly, it's one-time money because it's from reserves. And of course, how uh, a government which is running debt can have any reserves in any department is a question that I don't quite understand. Nonetheless, um, I, one wonders whether we're going to be asking the minister more pointedly uh, what the expectations are for the future with respect to tuition fees because clearly, this is a one-time effort to maintain fees at their current levels. But one wonders what's going to happen in 2014-15 from the perspective of uh, the institutions, but also from the perspectives of the students. Because uh, the last time the government did something like this, the following year, 
from it after the fees had been frozen for that year, there was a double increase that the students then faced. And so one suspects that that's what gonna, what's going to happen. So I think we should be asking the minister for clarity on that point and make, get the, the government to make a statement on that. So will we be, will we be doing that? So we already have, and uh, the minister has uh, uh, thus far simply indicated that he uh, plans to have us uh, discuss um, the, first of all, uh, have us discuss the Post-Secondary Learning Act by opening it up, and as a part of that, have us discuss the funding model. In, in that discussion related to funding model, he has indicated is where the discussion about tuition will take place. Uh, in terms of the, um, whether these are one-time funds or not, uh, the, it's been very uh, fuzzy, and so I would say uh, we are, at this point in time, assuming these are one-time funds because we have no assurances that they're anything but. And so, um, of course, we're very concerned about that. And so we have had that discussion uh, with the minister as, as presidents. And when we identified the top priorities as presidents uh, moving forward from a system perspective, we identified tuition as one of the top priorities for discussion. So we will be uh, having another meeting, I think sometime in May, and uh, we will be pushing the minister to, uh, to discuss uh, tuition as part of um, of our ongoing discussions about the system, but uh, you know we have the same uh, concerns that you've expressed, Chris, and, and we will be uh, pushing uh, very hard. We did, uh, just so you know, at the meeting uh, with the minister, we pushed back very aggressively with the minister on the budget, or on the, the um, tuition freeze, uh, because for one thing, we had not heard really this uh, widespread uh, demand for this, even from a student perspective, uh, but the minister was uh, very firm on uh, this uh, this freeze, uh, and so uh, we're left with you know what we're left with. But going forward, um, the tuition discussion needs to happen. Are there any other questions, uh, Laurel? Is there anything from? Uh, okay. Well, um, listen. Let me again thank all of you for, for being here today. It's uh, terrific to see so many people. I wish it was under better circumstances and I, I would encourage everybody to come back to the Long Service Awards in this very same uh, room because uh, at that meeting we serve beer and wine and so it'll be a lot more fun. Um, I would also um, just re-emphasize what Nancy talked about and that is that um, we will continue to communicate uh, with you we will continue to ask you for your input as we move uh, forward. And uh, we will ensure that as we move forward, we stick to the three values that are so fundamental to ensuring that we make uh, the right decisions uh, on this uh, budget reduction process. Um, Nancy, any, anything? All right, so thank you very much, folks, and uh, have a good rest of the week. <laughs>